Hi Year 4. Um, so yesterday's um, street child was actually really, really sad, wasn't it? And that was when um, Shrimps died and um, he hadn't eaten. He didn't want to go to the workhouse or to the hospital because um, those places were just so horrible at the time that he would rather not be around. So Jim is in a bit of tricky place. But if you remember the work we did on Dr. Bernardo and all the different, um, the good that he did and giving children somewhere to live, this is where Dr. Bernardo comes into this story. So chapter 26 is called Goodbye Brother. Bye brother, said Jim. He put the boots next to the sack and slipped away. He had no idea where to go now. He knew he couldn't live in the crates again, not without shrimps. He shivered in a shop doorway until he saw policemen coming, then darted across the road. It was easy to hide in the darkness between the lamps, but he couldn't stay there all night. It was too cold to stand still and too muddy to sit down. For the first time he wondered where all the other street boys slept. He remembered what one of the boys had said. He ain't got the strength to climb up with us, so we brought him here. Climb, Jim thought. Climb where? He wandered round the back of the crates, round behind the market schools. Nothing. Nothing to see, yet he thought he could hear a slight burst of chattering, like the whistlings of starlings. He stood still. The sound was coming from over his head. Then he heard a slight scuffing. He glanced round, no one in sight. He ran to the support wall of the market and heaved himself up, hand over fist, and at last hauled himself up onto the roof. He stood up slowly, gazing across the looped tarpaulin. Everywhere he looked, there were black bundles, like little heaps of rags, but as he stood still and let his eyes grow, he realised that each of those bundles were boys, huddled up for the night on their rooftop home. Chapter 27 is Barney, and Barney is Dr Bernardo. There was no comfort there. At night, the wind seemed to crack round the boys like a whip. When it rained, they would wake up soaked to the skin. It would be days before they dried off sometimes. Jim used to lie, huddled up, looking at the stars and listening to the boys breathing. This ain't home, he said to himself. When morning came with its sooty mist, the, boy would, the boys would roll down, to the, down the wall to be on the alert before the police were about, trying to earn a few pennies to buy themselves a night at a lodging house. They ate what they could, grabbing a bit of cheese or a crust of pie there, and if they were caught, they were hauled off before a magistrate and sent to the workhouse. Jim wasn't as fast as the other boys because of his bad leg and the only job he could think of doing was skipping for the theatre cues, which made a few people smile anyway. The other boys worked in gangs when they were stealing, passing the scarf or purse from one to the other so rapidly that it was impossible to tell what was happening. To Jim, they were like a big family helping each other, but he wasn't one of them. They tended to leave him on his own. One day, when he woke up drenched to the skin again and shaky with cold, he knew he'd had enough. If you go on like this, Jim, you'll be where shrimps is, he told him. There must be something else, brother. It was then that he remembered the ragged school. He thought of the long shed that the school was held in. Somewhere to keep warm, he thought. And that Barney bloke looked all right. He won't hit you, he won't. He decided to give it a try, just for one day. He wandered round until he found the shed again. Children were crowding round the door when he arrived, waiting to be let in. The shed was a big room with boards laid on top of soil for a floor. The walls and rafters had been painted a dingy white and there were bars across the windows. There was a good fire burning in a grate and Jim sidled up to it. There must have been over a hundred children there. They sat in rows but there were so many of them that some of them were on the floor. Jim gazed round him, listening to their chatter and to the way it faded down when the teacher stood up to talk to them in his gentle, lilting voice. He was a tall, slim man with straight brown hair and fluffy side whiskers and spectacles. Jim recognised him straight away as the man Lane Betsy has taken him to see to go and see in the back alley. He remembered shouting at him and how some of the boys had chucked mud balls at him. He remembered the man's sad eyes. He ducked his head down, worried now, in case he would be recognised and thrown out. Yet he could see that the children weren't afraid of the man. They didn't flinch away from him as if they expected him to hit them at any minute. They called him teacher and they seemed to be happy to do whatever he told them, that they murmured and giggled amongst themselves and if they couldn't remember... And as if they couldn't concentrate for very long. The teacher man didn't seem to mind. Occasionally, he looked at Jim, but Jim always put his head down or glanced away. At the end of the day, the man asked all the children to stand up and pray with him. And again, Jim looked away. He was the only child still sitting, but the man didn't seem to mind. They finished off the day with a hymn, which all the children yelled out cheerfully before they sent off home. 
Still, Jim sat by the fire, hoping not to be noticed. The Barney man finished straightening up the benches and wiping the board, and at last he came over to Jim. It's time for me to blow the lights out, he said in his soft voice. Jim didn't move. Come on, my lad, the Barney man said. It's time to go home now. Jim clenched and unclenched his fists. The gentleness in the man's voice made his throat ache. The man stood up. Come on now, you better get home at once. Please, sir, said Jim, let me stay. Stay? The man stared down at him. What for? I'm going to put the lights out and lock the door. It's quite time for a young boy like you to go home and get to bed. What do you want to stop for? Please, sir, said Jim, not looking at the man, but at the flames in the fire which made his eyes smart and blurry. You ought to go home at once, Barney insisted. Your mother will know if, if the other boys have gone. She'll wonder what kept you so late. I ain't got no mother. Your father, then? I ain't got no father. Barney was getting impatient. Jim could see that. It was almost as if he didn't believe him. Where are your friends, then? Where do you live? I ain't got no friends. I don't live nowhere. Barney stood at him, stared at him. He walked away from the fire and back to it again. It's the truth, sir, he said anxiously. I ain't telling you no lies. He spoke in the whiny voice that other street boys use to adults. Tell me, the man said at last, how many boys are there like you sleeping out in the streets? Heaps, Jim said, more than I can count. It was Barney's turn now to stare into the fire, as if there were secrets in its flames, or answers to great puzzles. He was as still and quiet as if it had gone to sleep. And Jim kept still too, afraid to break into the man's thinking. The only sound was the spitting of the logs, and outside the bleak voice of the wind. Now, the man said very slowly, like someone creeping up on a bird in case they frightened it away. If I am willing to give you some hot coffee and a place to sleep in, will you take me to where some of those other boys are? Jim looked sideways at him. You wouldn't tell the police? No, said Barney, I wouldn't tell the police. All right, said Jim, I'll take you. It was some time later that they arrived at the high wall of the market. Jim stopped, afraid again. What if Barney told the police about them and sent them all the, all the boys to the workhouse? But if he didn't show Barney, he wouldn't get the hot meal and the shelter to sleep in. He didn't know what to do. Barney seemed to understand and just stood waiting and watching while Jim glanced from side to side, afraid to be seen by anyone in the man's company. He'd almost made up his mind to run away and leave when the man said, What's your name? Jim, sir. Out it came, and it sounded such a special thing. That's it now, Jim thought to himself. That's the last thing I've got, and I've just given it away. Where are they, Jim? Up there, sir. Jim pointed to the roof of the market shed. There? And how am I to get up there? I'll show you. Jim made light work of it. There were well-worn marks on the bricks where the mortar had fallen or been picked away. Jim shinned up quickly and then leaned over the edge, holding down a stick. Barney grabbed it and heaved himself up and stood shakily, brushing his clothes and his grazed hands. He held up a lantern. And there, all round him, lay the boys, curled up in their rags of clothes, sleeping. And that is that chapter. Okay? Tomorrow is the end of the story, the very last chapter of Street Child. <laughs>